Well, hello and welcome to the Hills. Preacher Rick here. I'm welcoming all of you in person at the North Richardson Hills campus, West Fort Worth campus, Keller campus, and all of you in Dallas who are meeting together, forming the core group that's going to help us launch our Dallas campus next spring. And of course, I want to welcome all of you that watch online across our city, across our state, across our country, and literally across the world. But what I am about to say is especially for those of you who are a part of our great state. What about those Texas Rangers? Wasn't that fun? (laughs) We are the home of the World Series champions. And I know for you that are especially baseball fans, uh, this is a glorious, glorious time. I celebrate with you and I ask a favor of you. If you've been praying for the Rangers, would you please start praying for the Cowboys, okay? (laughs) Because I waited over 50 years to watch the Rangers win a World Series. Look at me. I don't have that long to wait for the Cowboys to get to a Super Bowl. So give me some love. So we do celebrate. That was a lot of fun. We're wrapping up a series called It's a Must. The premise is so simple. If Jesus said something is a must... And if you call Jesus your Lord, then what he said is a must can't be treated like a maybe. And we've seen the words of Jesus be very clear about things he absolutely expects of his disciples that we would say are non-negotiables. And we're going to look at one more today. And I want to introduce it with this story of a young monk that entered a monastery And after he had been there a short time, the abbot said to him, now, it is, as you know, our custom each morning to meet in our chapel, and someone brings a homily. We pass this privilege around. So tomorrow morning, you will give the homily at chapel. Well, the reason he entered the monastery in the first place is because he was timid and shy. He got up the next morning. His knees are shaking. His hands are trembling. His voice is quivering. He stands up and he says, Do you know what I am about to say? And of course, everyone shook their head no. He said, neither do I. Let's stand for the benediction. (laughs) The abbot was not pleased, but he offered some grace. said, I know it's a scary proposition, but this is for your own good. So tomorrow, you're going to do it again. So the next morning, he stood up and he said, do you know what I'm about to say? Well, this time, everyone shook their head yes. He said, well, if you know, I don't need to tell you. Let's stand for the benediction. (laughs) The abbot is furious. He calls him in and says, you pull a stunt like that again, I will kick you out of this monastery. Tomorrow, you are going to bring the homily for chapel. Don't disappoint me. That next day, chapel is packed. And everyone's wondering what's going to happen. He stands up and he says, do you know what I'm about to say? Well, about half of them shook their heads no. And about half shook their heads yes. He said, good. Let those who know tell those who don't. Let's stand for benediction. (laughs) Okay. Our mission as a church is to make and grow followers of Jesus. We think it's non-negotiable. We think that mission was given to us by Jesus himself, to make and grow followers of Jesus. And it is impossible to accomplish or pursue this mission unless those who know tell those who don't. Because the gospel is more than an announcement, but it is not less. Some of you my age remember years ago a car commercial by Mercedes-Benz. It showed one of their sleek sedans crashing into a wall, the front of the car collapsing in, but the dummy behind the steering wheel was not impacted by the crash. They were announcing the development of a new design that absorbed energy and protected the people in the car. They went on to say that though it would have been quite marketable and lucrative to patent the design, they did not but they offered it freely to all automakers around the world. And the last thing you heard on the commercial was the voice say, because some things are too important not to share. And I would think we would all agree that there are certain kinds of knowledge that if you possess it and you know someone else in a certain situation needs it and you don't share it, you are morally wrong. Listen close to what I'm about to say. Jesus put himself in that category. That Jesus said of himself, I am too important not to share. Who 
does such a thing? What would you think of me if I said, you have knowledge of me, but many people have no knowledge of me. You must tell everyone you know who has no knowledge of me all that you know about me. You would think I was egotistical. What kind of person says it is morally wrong not to let someone who doesn't know about me know about me? Well, when God becomes flesh, he gets to say that. So listen to the words of Jesus. I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me. Because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Now, all four Gospels of the life of Jesus end with a commissioning. They read a little different in each one. But each Gospel ends with Jesus commissioning his disciples to go into the world as witness says. And this reveals two assumptions Jesus held that are important for us to unpack. The first assumption is that Jesus believed the world really does need saving. Jesus does not hold the popular current a secularist worldview that we're all evolving, we're all progressing, the world is just increasingly getting better and better. He does not believe that. He does not think this world needs to be repaired. He thinks this world needs to be redeemed. And so he does not think you're just sharing good news. You are sharing essential news. This world needs saving. And the second assumption behind Jesus' commissioning was this. That Faith in him was a must. That the world needs saving and that he is the world's savior. And this is a pretty bold thing to say. In a culture that says nobody has a monopoly on truth, Jesus says, I do. He had just got through saying a few seconds before, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that's a pretty bold thing to say. But remember, he is 24 hours away from hanging on a cross. He's about to go and leave that room and go out into a garden and pray. Is there any other way? And the Father said, no. So you can understand Jesus does not believe that his gospel is optional. That he did not go to a cross and die when there are many other ways to be right with God. He believed the world needs saving. He believed he was the world's savior. He really did believe that people needed his gospel. But he also believed that his gospel needed a people. The spirit of truth will testify me, about me. You also must testify. I like telling the story of the pastor greeting people as they filed out of church on Easter Sunday. He said to one man as he shook his hand, you need to join the Lord's army. And the man said, I'm in the Lord's army. The pastor said, why do I only see you on Easter and at Christmas? The man said, I'm in the secret service. Here's what you need to know. Secret discipleship is not an option. Jesus never offered anyone a follow me secretly plan. He's not asking us to save anyone. He's expecting that we will witness to the one that can save everyone. But let's be honest. So many Christians treat this must like a maybe. And the tragedy is not that so many believers are living secretly sinful lives. But that so many believers are living secretly Christian lives. They want to be good people without ever having to speak good 
news. But Jesus does not commission us to go into the world as moral humanitarians. Many people do, who have no use for God, who have a totally secular worldview. But we admit they do some good things in the world. He doesn't send us just to do good things in the world. He sends us to be faithful witnesses. In Mark 13, 10, Jesus said, the good news must be told to all people. This is a fundamental conviction of the leadership of this church. This is why we're currently helping start 17 new churches across this country. This is why we are sending missionaries to some of the most unreached people groups on the earth. Because everyone must be told the good news. This is why we're going to have an offering next Sunday, and we anticipate raising over $3 million because we are driven by the must of Jesus. But let's unpack it a little bit more, because if Jesus said you must testify, then there are some implications we need to grasp. And here's the first. Words are a must. You need words to give a testimony. Now, let me just ask, is anyone else here married to someone whose love language is words of affection? Because I am, and I did not know that when I got married. (laughs) If I had known that the first couple of years of our marriage, we could have avoided some issues. Because my love language is gifts and acts of service. And I assume my wife knows that I love her. I am doing the dishes. But my wife's love language is words of affection. She needs to be told, not just uh, witnessed by example. And so she learned this trick. I'm about to fall asleep. And she would say, tell me three things you love about me. Then she learned another trick. Tell me three things you love about me that have nothing to do with my appearance. And I had to learn to be bilingual. I had to learn to communicate love so that she could hear it. And she needed words. Now, I am going to be quick to acknowledge We can talk the talk all we want. And if we don't walk the walk, our words don't matter. We all acknowledge we can say whatever we want to say about Jesus. And if we don't live like Jesus, no one is going to listen. Let's even acknowledge that sometimes we have to walk the walk to earn the right to talk the talk. So we acknowledge all of that. But let me be clear. True Christian witness is show and tell. And witness without words unintentionally preaches a false gospel. Let me explain. I have a neighbor. And I want to do good by my neighbor. And so when his wife gets sick, we take meals over in the evening. When they're on vacation, we pick up the kids from school. When he breaks his leg, I mow his yard. And when he's diagnosed with terminal cancer, I visit him in the hospital. And my neighbor dies. What gospel have I witnessed to my neighbor? I have witnessed the false gospel of salvation by goodness. That God saves good people. God does not save good people. God saves forgiven people. This is why when Jesus said, is there any other way the father led him to a cross? And you don't learn that truth just by watching. It requires words. Listen to second Corinthians chapter five. God was in Christ, 
making peace between the world and himself. In Christ, God did not hold the world guilty of its sins, and he gave us this message of peace. So we have been sent to speak for Christ. It is as if God is calling to you through us. We speak for Christ when we beg you to be at peace with God. Christ had no sin, but God made him become sin so that in Christ we should become right with God. You can't learn that just by watching. It takes words to explain what happened in the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. How we could receive righteousness we could never earn. This is what it means to be an ambassador. I have met some ambassadors in my life. They have an interesting job. They represent one country in another country, and it's not their job to be creative. It's their job to be faithful. An ambassador gets messages, maybe from his prime minister or from his president or from his king. And his job is to take that message and deliver it exactly like he received it to the other country. He is not responsible for how they respond. He is simply responsible to faithfully deliver what he has received. It is a must. And Paul understood that. Even when he was in prison for what he spoke, he still understood that. Listen to the prayer request he makes to the Ephesian church. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in change. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, there's a prayer you need to pray for every church planner and every missionary we support. God, give them words and give them boldness because faithfulness is always going to demand fearlessness. That's the second thing Jesus knew. Courage is a must. See, one thing I love about Jesus, he is so honest. He doesn't do bait and switch. He doesn't give promises that he knows can't be fulfilled. And so I want you to look at what he said after he said, you must testify. The very next thing he said was this. I've told you these things to keep you from giving up. People will put you out of their synagogues. Yes, the time is coming when those who kill you will think they're offering service to God. They will do this because they have not known the Father and they have not known me. So Jesus understands that when he says witness is a must, it could come at a price. That everyone must hear about him. He doesn't promise everyone will want to. You see, we have an enemy. There is a prince of darkness that is opposed to every single church we're trying to start, to every single attempt to translate the Bible, to every single effort to take this word to places that hasn't heard it yet. We have an enemy. And the devil is going to try to stop the message by intimidating the messenger. Hell's favorite slogan is silence is golden. And when Christians are silent, fear is almost always present. And faith is almost always absent. Remember, Jesus never pulled anybody aside and said, I have an option for you. It's called secret discipleship. So in 2006, I'm not sure how this happened, but I was invited with some other uh, leaders in the Christian faith in America to visit with Communist Party officials in Beijing, China. I vividly remember sitting in the office of the cabinet minister over all religion in the nation of China. While he proudly boasted to us that there is absolute freedom of religion in China. He even showed us the constitution that allowed for freedom of religion. There's a church in China sponsored by the communist government called the T-Self Church. I met some members of it. It might shock you if you visited that church next Sunday, you could hear the Bible read and hymns sung. 
and prayers prayed. What you cannot do if you attend the T-Self Church is evangelize. It is illegal for you to try to persuade anyone in your family or in your neighborhood to come to church with you. Now, you know that there is a burgeoning underground church in China. Conservative estimates are at least 50 million people. I think it's much higher. They really struggle to accept the T-Self church as their brothers and sisters in Christ. The way they think is, if you are not brave enough to speak of Jesus, how can you call yourself a follower of Jesus? It's not my place to judge anybody. It is my place to make it clear that when Jesus talked about testimony, he used the word must. He told us hostility was coming in order to encourage us because he also knew someone else was coming to help us. And that's the third big thing we must unpack. Power is a must. He said, I will send the advocate, the spirit of truth. And the reason we can be fearless is because Jesus did not leave us defenseless. Anything Jesus expects, he empowers. He says, I know hostility is real, but so is the presence of the Holy Spirit. He said before he sent them out in Acts 1, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Do you understand? Jesus believed that in the power of the Spirit, his disciples could go anywhere in the world and preach good news. He didn't say it'd be easy. He said it was doable. That in the power of the Spirit, there is no place where more disciples can't be made. The Holy Spirit comes, and he shows us how to talk and walk. He teaches us how to do show and tell. He does something to us so we can do something through us. You see it in the book of Acts, chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 7. Every time in Acts, there is a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Immediately, there is a bold proclamation of the news about Jesus. Which leads me to make a bold statement. Could it be that much of the evangelistic apathy among Christians today is the inevitable consequence of lack of intimacy with the Holy Spirit? Could it be that what we need in the church today more than apologetics courses, more than sermons, is a revival of the Holy Spirit in the church? Because in the Bible, when somebody gets filled with the Holy Spirit, the next thing they do is look for someone they can talk to about Jesus. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the sense of your inadequacy is overwhelmed by confidence in his sufficiency. I don't have to have it all figured out or know everything. I just need to be bold for Jesus. The Holy Spirit will do the rest. Some of you have read books by the famous theologian R.C. Sproul. He's got a great conversion story. He went to college. He wasn't a believer. He was on a football scholarship. He and a buddy were going to go out and hit the bars. He forgot his cigarettes, went back into the dorm. The captain of the football team was sitting in the lobby and said, freshman, get over here. So he sat down. And the captain started sharing his faith just by showing how wise the Bible is. He even quoted Ecclesiastes 11, verse 3. Ready for this? Wherever a tree falls to the north or the south, wherever it lays, it will stay there. R.C. Sproul says, I've got to be the only person in history that was converted by that verse. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit showed up and started convicting me that I'm just a dead, rotten tree going nowhere. And that's what happens when we walk out in the power of the Spirit. People start to come under conviction. See, we've got a message the world needs to hear, and we've got a power the enemy must fear. And so all over the globe, 
Bold disciples are sharing good news. Friends, I want you not to be discouraged by all the articles and the papers about how poorly the church is doing. The church is exploding. The church is growing all over the world. And the fastest growing nations of, in the world are those that are forbidding the preaching of Christianity. The Holy Spirit is empowering bold witnesses, and we are a part of this. We are funding many of these amazing, amazing efforts because we believe that when in the power of the Spirit, Jesus is preached, people will begin to realize they must surrender to Jesus. It's happening. And we hear stories all the time. I've asked Chris Shelby, our Minister of Kingdom Expansion, to come and share a couple. Thank you, Rick. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It is a privilege and honor to be able to stand with you and to stand with the global church today and to testify to what God is doing. You know, that's one of the great strengths that God has given to the church is the power of testimony. Because we need to be reminded that we have a real God who is alive today, who is changing real people's lives in real circumstances, no matter what's going on around us. We need that to, to have our faith affirmed and to have our faith empowered to what God is calling us to do. So it is my honor today to be able to bear testimony to the persecuted church. Several months ago, uh, myself and several of our missionaries were able to travel to a nation in Central Asia. And we were invited there by some of our brothers and sisters to come and just spend time with them, hear their stories, and then to do some equipping and church planting and disciple making. And what an honor it was to get to be with them. We, uh, we had a wonderful time together. And at one of our breaks, there was a young lady there. Uh, she was about uh, 21 years old. And she pulled me aside and said, can I talk to you at one of our breaks? And I said, absolutely. We'll call her Fatima because it's not uh, possible to share her name publicly today. But she sat down for me across the table and you know, she had that fire in her eyes. Have you ever been with somebody that's got the fire in their eyes, right? Like fire in their bones where they know that Jesus is the realest thing on the earth. Yeah, Fatima is one of those people. And she looked at me and she said, I love Jesus. And she said, I want my people to know about him. She said, every day I wake up and I have to get on a bus, a public bus that takes me a long way to where my school is. And every morning I wake up and I ask God, God, show me where to sit on the bus so that I can share my faith with somebody today. And you have to know that in this nation where Fatima lives, it is absolutely illegal to do what she's doing. She could be thrown in jail. She could be beaten on the spot, on the bus, or she could be killed. This is no joke. But she said, I want my people to know Jesus. And so I'm sharing my faith with them. She said, one day my mom found out that I was doing this. And she said, she came to me and she said, you have to stop. Their family are Christians, but she said, you have to stop sharing your faith or you might be killed. And she said, I looked at my mom. And I said, mom, you have three daughters. She said, if I'm killed for my faith, you will still have two and you will be okay. But as for me, I cannot stop sharing my faith. And I prayed over her. And I believe that Jesus is going to use that young lady to bring thousands of people to faith in Jesus in her country because she is determined that witness is a must. Yeah, we can clap. Yeah, absolutely. It's encouraging. And then I met her father-in-law, okay? We'll call him Brother H because I can't share his name. And, and I want to tell you Brother H's story. He told us while we were there about his testimony. And he said, I grew up in a, a, a Muslim family. I, he grew up in a, a family that did not know Jesus as most people in his nation are. And he said, after I got married and, and started to have a family, we heard about Jesus Christ. And me and my family decided we were going to follow him no matter what it cost. And it is costly to do what they've done. He said, when my family found out about it, 
He said they were very angry, and this is what happens a lot with persecution. The family is the primary ones that persecute the new believers. And he said, my family came and they basically captured us and they sequestered us to my, sequestered us to my parents' home. And they began to be abusive to us, they began to hurt us. And they told us, they said, you are going to stop this nonsense. You're going to return to Islam and you're going to recant your faith in Jesus or we are going to kill you tonight. And in, in this part of the world, honor killings are a very real thing. This is not just an empty threat. It's real. People lose their lives from their families often for bringing shame on their family from turning away from Islam. And Brother H looked at his family and they had violence in their eyes. But he said, no. He said, this is what's going to happen. He said, first, he said, I'm going to watch you kill my children. And then he said, I'm going to watch you kill my wife. And he said, before you kill me, I'm going to write you a letter and I'm going to tell everyone that I forgive you for killing me and my family. And then you're going to kill me. He said his family was very taken aback by that and didn't expect that response. And they sent them out of the room to discuss what to do. And so they spent a little time, they brought him back in and they said, okay, we've decided that we're not going to kill you, but you are going to recant your faith. You're going to turn away from Jesus and you're going to come back to Islam. Or we're going to strip you naked, you and your entire family. We're going to force you out into the streets and you will leave here nothing, leave here with nothing for following Jesus. Brother H said he was very sad when he heard this. He said, this is very difficult, Lord. But he said in that mind, the Holy, in, in that moment, the Holy Spirit reminded him about what happened to Jesus. And he looked at his family and he said, if this was good enough for Jesus, this is good enough for me. Do what you want. Do what you want. His family didn't expect that response either. Didn't know quite what to do with him. They sent him out again. They brought him back in and they said, okay, we're not going to strip you of everything, but unless you turn from your faith in Jesus, we're going to force you to leave here. We're going to disown you and your entire family and you can take nothing with you. You will have nothing for following Jesus. And Brother H said, let it be. And so his family forced them to leave that night and they walked out into the street with nothing. And as Brother H is telling us this story, he pulls out some nail clippers and go to this next slide here. He pulls out some nail clippers and he said, you see these nail clippers? He said, this was the only thing that I was able to take with me from my family's house that night that we lost it all. But he said, I want you to know that this is now my most powerful tool, one of my most powerful tools for sharing my faith in our country. And he said, I take these nail clippers and this is a picture of him actually doing it. He said, I take my nail, nail clippers and I go and find people in our streets in our city who are very poor, who can't even clip their nails. And he said, I asked him if I can do this and I begin to clip their nails. And he said, I tell them, today I want to clean your hands. But what I really want to do is tell you about the God who can clean your heart. And Brother H family has now made hundreds and hundreds of disciples and has planted churches all across his nation because he is determined that witness is a must. You know, it's often uh, easy to hear stories like this and to think, wow, that's amazing. And that is for another people at another time. And that's not for me. But here's the power in the persecuted church, something that I think we can learn from them today. The power of the persecuted church comes from they know what story they've surrendered to. In the persecuted church, it is too costly to say, well, maybe Jesus one day, um, I don't really feel like it this day. Maybe Jesus one day, maybe not. The persecuted church doesn't have that luxury. It's too costly. You either are in or you are out. Because here's the deal. The story that you surrender to is the story that you will witness to. And the persecuted church empowers us and encourages us today to say, brothers and sisters, witness is a must. Thank you. Amen.
We celebrate and we praise God because there are stories like this we hear every week from literally around the world. And so next week, we have the privilege. We have the privilege of supporting works like this, getting the Bible into languages of people who don't have it, helping start new churches, supporting people who have gone to some of the most unreached places in the world at great risk often to testify because they know it is a must. And I know that you're going to pray this week and that you're going to sacrifice and that we're going to celebrate next week at what we do in our harvest offering. Because we know the future, don't we? That Jesus is going to return. That God is going to exalt him who humbled himself. And here's what the scripture says in Philippians 2. Every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. Everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and everyone will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, Paul is not talking about universal salvation. He's talking about universal acknowledgement. Someday, every creature is going to acknowledge that the good news was true news. And the question of who is Lord will be eternally settled. Heaven will celebrate his lordship. Hell will submit to his lordship. But no one will challenge his lordship. Every person will testify that Jesus is Lord. It's a must. Our mission is to tell people to call Jesus Lord today. While it is an option, because on that day, it will be a must. So, I want us to pray about it, and I want you to uh, bow your head, please, and let me pray over you, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit right now to put on your heart a face or a place, either someone you know that needs this good news or a place that you care about that needs this good news. Everyone right now, I want you to think about a face or a place. So Father, right now, thousands of faces and places are being lifted up to you. And there is not a face or a place where you do not reign, where it cannot become on earth like it is in heaven. So for each face, God, and for each place, we ask for a bold witness, someone who will testify by walk and by talk that Jesus is Lord. Give us, Father, greater urgency the urgency that Jesus felt when he went to a cross that all the world needs to know. Father, we want to close this prayer and we want to pray for the persecuted church. We have brothers and sisters around the world that are paying an immense price to be bold in their faith. We lift them up and we pray, God, that they will have a greater experience of your presence. We also pray that we will have a greater experience of their passion. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.